saying uh, that I don't have enough willpower. Well, uh, you know, no one has enough willpower. Okay? The problem with self-control is at first we need to identify that there is a problem. Okay? We need to identify a conflict. Then the second challenge is doing something about it once you realize that this is a behavior that you want to change. I yell at Fishback. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Excited to be here today. Given the fact that we are midway through March now, how many people do you think have failed at their New Year's resolutions by this point? Uh, well, uh, we have the data from last year. Um, I would say uh, about a, a quarter, uh, maybe a little bit more. So it's not true that everybody ditched their resolutions. Uh, that's just not the case. But uh uh, many did, and by November, we expect most people to drop the resolution. So by then, we expect only like 25% to still do it till the I'm, end of the year. I'm surprised <laughs> that 75% of people are still holding on in March. I would have thought there would have been more of a drop-off by then. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't know about this year. I know about the, like the previous da data that we looked at. Uh, and let's say they didn't lose hope. Okay? They are still doing it. Okay? They are still uh, uh, trying. They are probably not doing as much as they plan, but who doesn't? What determines whether someone sticks to a resolution or not? Uh, intrinsic motivation. Uh, that is uh, uh, how much it feels good at the moment. It feels right. Okay? They enjoy doing it. They are excited doing it. And, uh, uh, and it's a bit surprising because the reason we set a resolution is not because we enjoy doing it. Okay? Like we, we set a resolution not because it's fun to do. We don't set to eat more ice cream and watch more TV in 2022. Uh, we set a resolution that is something that's important for us. And uh, for most people in America, that would be health-related goals. So that's about 60% of their resolutions. Uh, then the second one is anything related to finance, like getting a job, sticking to my job, saving more money, and uh, th then we have a few uh, others. These are not necessarily the things that people are excited to do because it's fun. And nevertheless, what predicts is how much it feels good at the moment that you pursue that resolution. Wouldn't that mean that it's basically impossible to complete a resolution which wasn't fun in the moment? <laughs> Uh, yes, that is uh, unfortunately the the case. Now, it's you know some some people set really short term goals. Okay? Like I uh, you know I need to uh, uh, do some medical checkup, and yeah, you can do that even if it's not fun. Okay, you just uh, go there and you do it, and it's over. Uh, but this is not the typical resolution. The typical resolution is to eat eat healthier food or to exercise more and. If it's not fun, that's not going to work. What have you looked at between uh, a focus on process versus a focus on outcomes or goals? Because when James Clear brought Atomic Habits out, whatever, three years ago or four years ago, I think everybody thought, right, this is it. I'm just going to focus on the process. I can have growth without goals. You know, you do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. How true has that been borne out in the psychological literature? <laughs> So you need a goal. Okay? If you uh, don't have a goal, then you don't set a resolution in the first place. Okay? If you don't know that you want to eat healthier food okay, or exercise more, then you'll never get there. And by the way, we recently found that the extent to which people are extrinsically motivated, the extent to which they are they are motivated by the, uh, the goal and by setting a goal that is more long-term, and that also predicts whether they will set another goal next year. Okay, So these are the people that are goal-driven, that have these long-term destinations. Uh, and it, it's important to have. I would not drop that. It's just that it's not enough. And often the process matters more than we think. But definitely start with a goal. How do you define the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation? <laughs> uh, good question. Uh, intrinsic motivation is doing something as its own end, okay? that it feels right at the moment. The purpose is not necessarily to reach the destination, but to enjoy what I'm doing uh, right uh, uh, now. Uh, extrinsic motivation is the 
surprised by the end okay, is what I get from completing the goal, from being done with uh, uh, something. Now, the truth is that for the goals that we care about, they are never 100% intrinsically motivating, right? You know, what like what, a walk in the park on a nice day is only intrinsically uh, motivating, okay? Like a dinner with a loved one is only intrinsically motivating, but no one sets these goals, okay? We, we would do this even if we didn't plan. Uh, what uh, uh, people set to do, which is the career, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, hobbies that require work, okay? Like exercising, uh, uh, saving money, uh, and so on. These are goals that are somewhat intrinsically uh, motivating, and the little that they are uh, really uh, matters a lot. Uh, so, you know, to, to give you an example, uh, we found that uh, when we make doing math for kids more intrinsically motivating, that is, they were doing math while they were listening to music, and we bought them pencils with all kind of colors and it was kind of fun to do. Uh, this is research with Caitlin Woolley at Cornell, by the way. Uh, what we found is that they were sticking with this longer. Now, did we make math class intrinsically motivating? For many kids, not really, only slightly more intrinsically motivating than it would have been otherwise. Do you only just need a little edge then a lot of the time? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you need to update that, right? So we know that people stick to their uh, workout uh, uh, if they find something that they like, but what I liked yesterday might be boring today, okay? Or maybe the weather has changed and what was fun to do outside yesterday is not fun to do today. And so we constantly need to adjust with a focus on how do I pursue my long-term goals such that they are right for me, that they feel good at uh, the moment. It seems to me that there's a, a tension or a, a trade-off, at least a little bit, between somebody in a planning mode where they're looking at what do I want to do longer term, what's the direction that I want to go in, perhaps even what are the steps that I would need to go through to get there, and then an executing mode where you're just kind of following the plan and, and working for the boss that was you a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago. Is that, is that something that you've noticed as well? Uh, yes, and it's interesting. There is a, a lot of work in uh, psychology on on these two uh, phases. Okay, uh, uh, some of the work. Uh, uh, this is by Peter Govitz here at uh, NYU. Uh, talks about being in a deliberative mindset where you deliberate your options, where you are kind of objective. You see what's possible for you versus the implemental mindset. And the implemental mindset is like now, now you are the contractor that you hired to do the work that uh, uh, the, the deliberator uh, decided to do. And, and now you are much more like focused on doing the thing that uh, you are not really evaluating the alternatives very carefully. Uh, there is work on assessors versus locomotors. Some people are just more assessors in, in their personality. And uh, this is something that Ari Kublansky uh, at the University of Maryland studied. Uh, they like to assess. They like to consider, should they do this? Should they do that? Like, what are the pros? What are the cons? They're giving you, like, these complicated tables. Uh, they don't necessarily make a decision. They think about it. And then other people are locomotors. Okay? They just move ahead. And uh, to the extent that they are extreme on locomotion, then often they don't assess enough. Okay? They just go through the motion without really thinking, is this the best uh, thing for me? And so you kind of need the right balance between assessing and moving and locomoting. Have you got any idea about the optimal uh, phase length for going from uh, assessing to locomoting or from uh, planning to executing? Three months, six months, one week? It really depends on the goal, right? Uh, uh, if it's uh, uh, your uh, morning exercise, then probably five minutes is plenty of time to decide what you're going to do. And, and it really doesn't matter. Just like do something. Okay. Uh, if it's your uh, career choice and you're going to make this decision in five minutes, uh, I, I would say uh, don't. Okay. And and sleep on it and be uh, a bit open to uh, 
not having closure or not having a decision until you really thought through uh, your options. And so, you know, sometimes we encourage people to think more before they do. Uh, sometimes we just say, you know, do it. Uh, yeah. uh, it doesn't really matter how, just do it. Overall, you've done a lot of work to do with motivation, both psychologically and then in uh, experiments, plus all of the other work that you've been looking at. What have you found that people get most wrong when they're thinking about motivation? Oh, people get a few things wrong. Uh, um, uh, let me mention a couple. Okay, uh, One is that uh, uh, people think that they should change uh, themselves, but it's actually better to change the situation. Uh, it's actually harder to change who we are and change our personalities compared with changing the, uh, the environment in which we operate. Okay, And it is really easy to eat healthier food when there is only healthy food around you. And it's really hard to do it otherwise. It's really easy to work when you're surrounded with colleagues that are uh, supportive and, and willing to help and it's almost impossible when you are in, in the wrong place with the wrong people that are not uh, uh, helping you and and so people often have the naive perception that if I just want something strongly enough then it will happen and then they encourage themselves to just like do what you need to do and then like uh, really try harder and, and often it's about removing the barriers, designing the environment that works best for your goals. Uh, the second mistake that I will mention is that people believe that their future self is going to be a, a much better person than their present self in a way. Uh, the future self is going to wake up early in the morning and do everything that they should during the day. And uh, their future self is not going to be tempted by you know, the social media or certain foods and so on. And, uh, and not showing uh, empathy to your future self is, is a mistake. It's like planning to drive many hours when you get up in the morning and you're fully awake and not having sufficient empathy to the person that you are going to be after three hours of driving. We just can't do that anymore. There's a, um, <laughs> there's a term in Japanese called revenge bedtime procrastination. Have you come across this? I, I am curious. Uh, so it's, it's a word similar to like schadenfreude or whatever the, in German that's just something that we don't have a concept for in English. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's called revenge bedtime procrastination, which is kind of the reverse of not having enough empathy for your future self. It's having too much disdain for the person that you were earlier in the day. So you haven't achieved what you meant to earlier in the day. So you punish yourself by staying up at night in an attempt to try and like get stuff done. But then all that you end up doing is making tomorrow morning hell for yourself. And then you kind of continue this cycle. I've certainly noticed with myself as well that you do have this sort of superhuman prediction about the person that you're going to be in future, especially when you're setting goals. You just have this presumption that all of the inefficiencies that you have in your system are going to be pushed out of the way by the sheer volume of goals that you create. Well, if I make enough crushing goals, then I'm going to have to squeeze all of the inefficiencies and my 20 minutes on YouTube here and my extra long walk over there and I'll make sure that I get to work on time and stuff. And it's just not the way that it works. I have a friend, Chris Sparks, who's a productivity expert, and he has a term where he says, in order to pick something up, you have to put something down. What he means by that is that it's safer to presume that your current level of output is the level of output that you're going to be at when you try and achieve this goal as well, as opposed to presuming that you're going to be this superhuman, incredibly resilient, much more effective version of you. That might happen, but probably not. I, I love that. The worst advice that I think I ever got was that if you have a lot to do, just wake up one hour early. Okay, and it's the worst advice because, as you know, if you wake up one hour early, you also go to sleep one hour early. You really don't make more time in the day by uh, doing that. You're just more tired. So, Why is yeah. it so hard to choose a goal? Like when people actually have to try and come up with something that's good. Why is it so difficult for them to do that? 
I, I don't know that it's hard. It's it's hard to set goals right and to set uh, the right goal for you. It uh, needs to be uh, a goal, not a chore. Okay, it needs to be something that uh, you like to do. Okay, that you uh, enjoy thinking about the destination and not necessarily that uh, uh, you know you, you think about all the the hard work that is involved. And uh, uh, to give you an example. Uh, do or approach goals work better than do not goals uh, because do not goals feel like a chore okay? and it's really hard to, to do this thing that I set up uh, uh, not to do. I mean, not to do the thing that I set up not to do. What's an example of that? Uh, uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, not uh, uh, to uh, smoke, uh, not to uh, uh, contact my ex, uh, uh, not to have certain thoughts. Like the classic study by uh, Dan Wagner was to ask ask people not to think about white bears. And guess what? Once you ask people not to think about white bears, there is nothing more that they want to do than thinking about white bears. Okay? Uh, it, it's really like not thinking about your ex or trying to push a tune out of your, your head. It's like the more you try to do it, the more this thing comes back to your mind. Uh, because how do you know that you are successful? You check yourself. You check yourself by bringing it back. So all, all these feel like sure. There is also reactance. Okay, when I tell myself that I should not eat something, I really want to eat that just because it's now being and uh, identifies the thing that I should not be eating. So uh, these goals tend to be like chores. You know, even like concrete goals like you need to be sufficiently abstract to, to motivate yourself if you think about your goal as a, as a saving for a house this is less motivating than buying a house or you know applying for a job is less motivating than uh, uh, getting a job uh, and so people often set their goals such that it's not that motivating uh, adding targets is helpful and often people have very vague goals so you know if i tell myself that i want to exercise three times this week or I want to finish a certain project by the end of the month this is better than I want to be successful at work or I want to work out uh, more and people don't always get this incentives can uh, be wrong for your goal okay setting a goal that doesn't fit with your incentives that uh, uh doesn't work very well. And then intrinsic motivation. We, we actually started there, setting a goal that is important but horrible to pursue. Uh, that uh, is not going to work. The difference between uh, approach and avoidance goals, I want to do something and I shouldn't do something. There are things that we don't want to do anymore and we do want to make a goal out of not doing them anymore. So what's a better way to reframe Let's say that somebody wants to stop smoking or spend less time on their phone. How should they frame the goal of spending less time on their phone or of stopping smoking? Ideally, in, in terms of what you want to do instead. Okay, And for the phone, that is actually easier than uh, for uh, quitting smoking. Uh, for the phone, is like, you know, when do you uh, use your phone too much? Okay, uh, For many people, that would be uh, before bed. Uh, or uh, when I wake up, what can you do instead? Okay, so have your goal to read a book before you fall asleep, and not uh, and not look at my phone before I uh, fall asleep. Uh, that is much more likely to uh, uh, to happen. Uh, for uh, quitting smoking, this is harder for people because it's really hard to find like what is the thing that that is the opposite of not smoking okay? like w what else can i put in my mouth okay like people often you know, when they try to stop drinking soda they replace it with water okay they just put something else in front of them so they can consume that thing instead uh, and, and then one thing that people can do is uh I think about these situations in which they they smoke and like what can you do instead in that situation that is fun, that is uh, rewarding, that's going to uh, make it uh, a pleasant time without uh, uh, smoking. It seems to me that boredom must play a, a little bit of an important role when it comes to what we're talking about here. Because if you need to replace doing something you don't want to do with another thing that you do want to do, the fix is always doing something. 
it's never that you're allowing yourself to have space within the day. I suppose that you could say I'm going to sit on the couch and not look at my phone, but there's going to be a fair bit of friction and temptation in doing that. So yeah, it it feels like very much a an, an active process of trying to do a thing instead of doing the thing you don't want to do anymore. <laughs> Uh, yes, and and, and uh, I like this example. Like, imagine like sitting in front of your phone, trying not to use it. Like, ah, that, that doesn't work for anybody, right? Uh, so uh, either you put something else in your hand that you do want to do, or you you know you go outside. Okay, you you do something else. You just don't sit there on the sofa, so you, you don't have this opportunity to uh, want to spend too much time on on your phone. Uh, or uh, your phone is not there, okay? uh, and and then again, you know, you you change the situation. Okay, if you want uh, your child uh, not to be on the computer, you take away the computer. Or if you want yourself not to be on on your phone, you take away the phone. Are there um, biological predispositions toward differing levels of motivation? Uh, probably so. Uh, but it's unclear that uh, uh, that they are that important. And I say probably so because we see that some people um, just have more grit, okay? they're just more motivated, they're just more able to uh, pull through. Uh, but we also see that uh, often there is a lot of variability between domains. So you, you might be... Uh, an, an amazing uh, uh, at work, okay, but uh, uh, not so good when it gets to uh, uh, controlling your consumption of junk food, okay. And my, I might be a, a very health conscious, uh, uh, but uh, uh, terrible at saving. And so, like, we see like these differences, which suggest to us that to the extent that there is like this general factor of like more motivated person, it doesn't explain everything. Uh, it is uh, the case that the, the self control, for example, is getting better with age. Okay. Um, oh, is that right? You get more self control mm -hmm. as you grow up. Uh, yeah, until they, uh, until later. Okay, and until it goes down again. <laughs> so, what age is that? <laughs> um, when uh, when you get better, or when uh, both. You, you, the, um, so beyond, like it, into your twenties, you are still getting better. So the like, teens uh, and and uh, like people in the twenties are still at the uh, uh, improve and, and part of it is just uh, uh, controlling uh, uh, impulse um, and you know, uh, older people are just generally less uh, uh, tempted have better control and and then I can't I can't remember the age for the the older uh, people's uh, studies but they. they if I remember correctly, it was something around seventy. But I mean, I, I I say this, and I you you hear my voice goes down because I'm not. I I like if someone says no, that like you got the age one, I I'd say well, I guess so. Uh, I would say that it's also unclear when self control goes down whether people are less able to inhibit, or they just don't care. I, that was what <laughs> I was thinking. The older yeah. older people just don't give a shit anymore. That might be. That might be it. Yes, I, I, you know, I, I tend to agree. I think that that's a large part of it. They just like whatever, you know. I, I can say whatever I want. I spend enough years here. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a acute motivation and setting goals and stuff. How can people ensure that their drive doesn't slow down after this first honeymoon period? Um, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> It depends on the on the goal again. Uh, for some goals, actually, there is an increase. Okay, in particular, when you think about the all or nothing goal, the more you do, the more motivated you are. So, if they take four year college, about half of the people that start college will drop out, and they usually drop out in the first or the second year. So, like you, it's harder at the beginning, and and it makes sense. Like your last year in college is getting you a college degree. Your first year is only getting you the, a quarter of a college degree, and so you you see that people work harder uh, or stick to their goal more toward the end. Same for also loyalty programs, by the way. Consumers drop them at the beginning when they are just one purchase away from the reward. They are not going to drop the program. Uh, so for some goals, you see that there is an increase in 
uh, motivation. Uh, even uh, you know, uh, animals uh, run faster uh, as they get closer to the reward, whether it's food or you know, for for your dog seeing you, they will run faster as they get closer to you. Uh, for uh, other goals, you see that there is a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning, and then it uh, it slows down. And if there is end, you'll see again an increase in, in motivation, uh, but you you'll have the middle problem, and uh, um, and. Uh, this is when uh, you are no longer excited by the beginning, you're no longer excited by the end, it's just a long stretch of the middle. Uh, we looked at it in one study, this is with the Rematur Artillery uh, in Israel, where people were lighting the candles on the menorah, and like they had to do it over the holiday of Hanukkah for eight consecutive nights. Many people were lighting the menorah on the first night, Eight days later, eight nights later, many people were lighting the menorah again on the last night in the middle. Ah, not uh, uh, so much. Uh, uh, so people uh, cut corners in the middle. Uh, people do less of uh, uh, good work. What to do? Keep meals short. Okay, a weekly exercise goal is better than a monthly exercise goal. Okay, monthly saving goals is better than an annual saving uh, goals. Uh, Short goals have short middles. So you're looking at um, creating progress markers along the way that allow you to hit those bit by bit by bit, even if you're then going to repeat it again for the following week or month or whatever. Exactly. And you nicely identify that when I say like a short goal, well, you know, it's not, if you have a weekly exercise goal, it's not, it's not. You don't just do it for one week. Yeah. You want to exercise again next week, but that's another goal. That's the goal that I'll have next week. Yeah, so you wouldn't say, uh, I want to exercise 150 times this year. You would say, I want to exercise three times every week. Yeah. Okay. Yes, because if you think about the number of times that you need to exercise this year. Huh. <laughs> well, this, um, I've seen studies around the finishing times for people in marathons and how yeah. they all bunch together around these totally are essentially totally arbitrary numbers right you like have loads of people that finish between three hours 58 and four hours or two but no one finishes it very few people finish it like four hours 10 or something they'll they'll push for the next particular milestone Yes, I, I love this study. This is a study that shows how effective targets are. Uh, once you, uh, uh, you know, you look at the distribution of marathon times, you see that there are so many that are doing it in under four hours compared to just above four hours. And, and you wonder, like, is it easier to run a marathon in three hours and 59 minutes than four hours and one minute? No, right? It, it's really like the, the, the idea that if I can get it under my, like, set goal which for many marathon runners it's four hours or three and a half hours or four and a half hours uh then uh, i achieved my goal okay in, in a way anything that is below that like specific time is is uh, a win and if i have like one minute after four hours uh, that is seen as a loss and we don't like uh, losses uh, but i would say that there is a problem with that like if we are to uh, attach to these numbers that we put to motivate ourselves, we we might end up cutting corners. Okay, we might end up uh, um, maybe pursuing the goal not in the right way. And let me give you a couple of examples. First is I I caught my son who's ten year old waving his hand in the evening, trying to get his Fitbit to get to the number of steps that he was hoping to have. And I bet he's not the only person who does that. Right, so you you want to meet the goal, but not really in the right way. And the other example comes from uh, Wells Fargo, who a few years ago had what they called the Great Initiative, and that was a program designed to sell every customer eight financial products. So the Great was G R eight. Um, as you can imagine, or as you might remember from seeing it on the media, uh, that uh, did not. Uh, go well. Uh, the only way to get customers to have eight financial incentives is by selling them, uh, sorry, eight financial tools, is selling them tools that they didn't need 
uh, or uh, often we're even unaware of. Okay? So as, as a customer, you, you were just paying for financial tools that you didn't know you, you owned. Goodhart's law in that way is so vicious. I see it in myself as well, right? That you you posit yourself uh, a, an outcome that then becomes a measure. And then all that you start trying to do is hacking the version of the measure that you wanted to do, like purposefully not drinking much water the night before your weekly check-in on the scales because you know that that's going to matter. And you're like, well, no, no, my, I know that I said I wanted to lose weight every week, but I didn't mean I just wanted to have less water in my body. What I actually meant was that I wanted to lose body weight as opposed to just fluids. So yeah, you, we're, we're so sneaky and tricky in that way. And another thing is that when we have dashboards and analytics, which are increasingly being given to us, right, in the modern world, you can very quickly create an outcome that becomes a measure and you can start to optimize for the thing that you think is what you actually want. The example I always use is with mailing lists. So somebody could say, um, I'm giving $100 to everybody that signs up for my mailing list and they get a million people sign up for the mailing list but then they don't give away the million dollars. So they may have achieved their goal of getting a million people onto their mailing list, but that wasn't actually the goal. The goal was I want a million people to want to sign up to my mailing list who feel like they're connected to me, who genuinely want to receive my messages with goodwill and don't hate me and aren't sending me loads and loads of complaints. Like that's the actual outcome that they wanted. But because we synthesize things down and we're able to look at dashboards, we see things in a lower resolution way. Uh, and that causes us to try and shortcut our own rules. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And these are all the ways in which our uh, targets can backfire, can lead us to pursue the, the wrong goal. If there is a shortcut, we should suspect that we are going to take the shortcut. Okay. So instead of eating less food, uh, you might drink less water. <laughs> uh, to get to the uh, desired uh, weight on the scale. Uh, and, and so we really need to be uh, thoughtful in setting these targets and realize that the only purpose to set it in the first place is to get people or ourselves to, to pursue the, uh, the goal. Uh, another problem that you didn't mention with targets is that we we tend to feel so bad when we miss out. Okay? And so if you, you know many people have calorie targets uh, uh, and if they just miss it by a little bit, then you have the what the hell effect which is like, well, today is ruined, okay? or the week is ruined. Now, this is completely like in your mind, okay, that you, you really, like the, the food that you are going to eat now has the same impact on you than, you know, the food that you ate before you, you missed your target. Uh, but you, you kind of gave up on yourself because you, you didn't quite meet your very optimistic uh, target. Is there a way that people can reframe that catastrophic mindset? Uh, there should never be a what the hell effect. <laughs> okay, uh, it is never a reason to uh, to lose it just because you lost it by a little bit. Okay, it's, there should never be a, a reason to uh, just you know yell at your your friend or partner uh, because you were already yelling. Okay, or. Uh, you know, give up on yourself in, in any other way. And uh, in, in my research, I uh, talk about uh, what your actions signal to yourself. Is it a signal about your commitment or a signal about your progress? Okay. And in, in this, like, what the hell situation, uh, people take their, their failure in, in this case, the fact that they could do something as a signal that they that they are uncommitted, that they are just they, they can't do it. Okay, it's like whatever. Okay, I, I'm just like uh, not doing it. Uh, if instead you take it as a signal of low progress or lack of progress, uh, then what you need to do is just try harder and, and make more progress. What role does feedback have in this? Uh, feedback is uh, is critical for pursuing our goals. Okay? Like we need to know where we stand. Okay? We, we need to uh, be able to look at ourselves or measure it somehow or have our uh, friends and mentors and bosses and colleagues uh, tell us how we are doing. Uh, so feedback is critical. The thing is that it is much easier to learn from positive feedback than from negative feedback. And uh, uh, we miss out on 
a lot of great information that is often in uh, negative uh, feedback. How can we become better at taking negative feedback then? Uh, we need to realize why it's hard. It's hard emotionally. That's actually pretty intuitive. It's also hard cognitively. Okay, It is easy to ignore uh, negative feedback because often what negative feedback tells us is what not to do. And now we need to do the mental switch into, oh, okay. Oh, it creates an avoidance goal for us, which we then need to flip into an approach goal. Exactly. Mm. Right. Like so that's... instead of you saying um, one of your bosses comes up to you about a meeting that you've been in and says, when you get nervous in a meeting, you look down at your hands and it doesn't look very good to the group of people that you're trying to present to. You then need to do the work of when I get nervous, I need to look up at the board or I need to fix my eyes onto somebody as opposed to just taking it in that this is the thing that I do and then obsessing over the fact that you look down at your hands when you get nervous. I, I love this example. <laughs> I, I'll tell you why, because I, I got the feedback before that uh, uh, I don't look into the camera in uh, uh, you know, Zoom or, or Skype uh, uh, calls. And the first thing when you hear this feedback is like, uh, what, why, why do you say that? Do you know how hard it is to look at the camera? I'm looking at the person and the person is below the camera. And, and, and really what you need to do is like the mental switch where, you know, instead of looking at the person, look at the camera okay and, uh, and so instead of looking at your hands uh, uh, no think about what you need to do look at some something else and this is not easy for for people by the way animals cannot do this at all okay when you uh, uh, yell at your dog the dog has no idea what is the correct behavior just that what they did was not something that you appreciated uh, so people oh, are a little yeah, bit that's, in, that's yeah. interesting so the dogs don't really have very good inference they they can do avoidant or they can do approach, but they probably can't turn an avoidant into an approach. Exactly. Exactly. When you yell at your dog that they should not do whatever they did on your carpet, they don't realize that the correct behavior is to go outside and do it on the grass. Okay. The, uh, you'll have to give positive reinforcement for that behavior because the, the punishment did do anything <laughs> that's really interesting so is there a is there a case to be made around um parents raising children or, or also training animals that you need to see if you want to try and have motivation to do things that you want them to do you need to almost look at uh, your feedback in two different pathways one focusing on approach and one focusing on avoidance Yes, and it is much easier to learn from positive feedback. Now, this is not to say that we cannot or should not learn from negative feedback. We should, because they, they, it, it happens. Okay? They, we take the, the wrong way and we can infer the right way by the fact that we took the wrong way. Uh, and, and so not learning from that would be absolutely a mistake. You know, even more than that, sometimes there are many right ways and only one wrong way okay like maybe all the dishes in this restaurants are amazing except for one that is bad and so really like knowing that this is bad is much more useful than knowing that everything else is, is good and, and so you you need to be able to learn from negative feedback but i agree with what you said and i know i write about it that if you're trying to teach someone the using positive feedback so much easier for them to learn what was the study that you did with the improv class? Oh, thank you. Uh, so, you know, I uh, said before, going back to the beginning of our conversation, uh, that we are going to stick to goals that feel good, okay? that if you feel good when you're doing it, if you feel right, then you're going to, to, to stick with it. Uh, but often what is going to feel good doesn't feel good when you just start it. Right? And uh, Improvisation is one of those things. When you just start improv, you are mainly going to feel embarrassed. And uh, uh, when we, we partner here with the Second City uh, Improvisation Club uh, in Chicago, uh, we studied just regular people, okay, not professionals, that are uh, going to uh, take an improv class. And we approach them in the very like first few uh, uh, classes. So they, they are just uh, uh, beginners. Uh, and at, at this point, we tell them, you know, your goal for this exercise is to uh, feel bad 
Okay, it's to feel uncomfortable, we find it. Uh, and when people had the goal to feel uncomfortable, they were more motivated. They wanted to come back. They actually spent more time on the exercise. They were taking more risk. So the exercise required them to you know, move in an interesting way. And they were more willing to like, move their body and like, make all kind of voices and, and so on. Uh, because they were more comfortable to feel uncomfortable. That was their, their goal. Uh, and so embracing the discomfort is often a way to initiate some habit. So Later on, it will be easier. <laughs> that's like preparing yourself for kind of realistically what's going to happen. A difficult medical procedure, an examination that you know that's going to be hard or whatever. I guess kind of warning yourself about that in advance helps you to be prepared. It's, it's, you know, it's warning and I think warning helps with self-control. It's even more than a warning here because if your goal was to feel uncomfortable, now that you feel uncomfortable, you know that this is working. Okay. It, it, it's like having your goal to sweat while you exercise. Like you, most people don't like to sweat. Okay. I don't like to sweat, but no, it, it's a sign that this is working, okay, that I'm doing it right. Okay? That, and so you don't want a pain-free exercise. So you know, it's more than uh, the, the preparation. It's uh, the signal in feeling uncomfortable changes. That's really good. I really like that. So talk to me about people don't just have one goal, right? It might be easier if life was just a singular track, and all that we were focused on was eating the right food, or starting the business, or the good relationship, or whatever. How do people juggle multiple goals? Yeah, right. It would be really nice to uh, want uh, uh, one thing, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we need to pick our battles and uh, uh, and decide between several goals. And uh, the, the first thing is to decide whether you are prioritizing or uh, uh, seeking some compromise or, or balance. If you are prioritizing, then you want to put one goal above others. Okay, maybe you want to put your your health goal above. Uh, uh, eating whatever you want, whenever you want to. Uh, often self-control kicks in, okay? and, and we can talk about that. Uh, when you balance, so when you seek a compromise, now you, you think about, let's say, like work and, and family. How do I fit them uh, together? Uh, how do I find activities that pursue several goals simultaneously? We call this, in psychology, multifinal means. Okay, they're like uh, the, the feeding uh, two birds with one scone. Uh, maybe I can uh, bike to work so that I get my commute and exercise at the same time. Okay, maybe uh, uh, I can uh, find uh, the food that uh, is is tasty. That's the most important goal for people when it gets to, to eating, uh, but is also healthy and not too expensive and uh, it doesn't take too much time and, and so on. And organizing your life such that you identify these activities that help you achieve multiple goals uh, is, is often uh, critical. Uh, then do you, I can talk about self-control and like prioritizing. Yeah, well, willpower and self-control, I think, is what a lot of people blame downfalls in motivation on. I certainly know that I do, right? That it's, especially, I guess, with avoidance rather than approach goals. But with that too, I, I didn't go to the gym today. It must be because I don't have enough willpower or I ate the food that I said I wasn't going to eat. It's because I don't have enough self-control. Uh, yeah, and, and this is uh, not a great attribution to have, okay? Uh, saying uh, that you, that I don't have enough willpower, well, uh, uh, you know, no one has enough willpower, okay? Like, so, so let's just not count on the, uh, willpower. Uh, the, uh, the problem with self-control is at first we need to identify that there is a problem, okay? We need to identify a conflict. We need to identify that this uh, one morning in which I uh, don't exercise matters, okay? Or, you know, one donut matters, or the one time I yell at my partner matters. Uh, and then the second challenge is doing something about it once you realize that this is a behavior that you uh, you want to change. Uh, for the identification part, it helps to use what we call a wide decision frame that is thinking about several decisions together. Okay, uh, What uh, uh, should I do uh, if I consider losing my partner, uh, losing 
not losing my partner, God forbid, losing my temper every time I yell at my partner. Uh, and uh, uh, Noah, uh, what comes to my mind here is actually a, a study about uh, financial decision making uh, with Abby Sussman, my colleague here at, uh, at the University of Chicago. And uh, she asked people how much money they are willing to spend on all kind of exceptional expenses, like going to a hotel room or you know, buying champagne, like uh, uh, you know, buying a gift to a friend. And she either asked them about one time or all the times that they will want to do it this year. And as you can imagine, when people think about all the times that they would like to buy a gift to someone this year, then they they are more financially responsible. Or, you know, all the time that I will stay in the hotel room this year, maybe I should not spend so much money than if I think about it just uh, once. Um, you know, going back to uh, my temper uh, uh, example, all the time that I'm going to be tired and uh, and and be tempted to just uh, lose it. Uh, when it gets to resisting the temptation that has been identified, what we find is that it helps to think about it in advance, to anticipate it. And you get this mental preparation. It's like, um, you know, I use the metaphor of preparing to lift a, a heavy box. If you know that it's going to be heavy, you mentally and physically, even like with your body, you approach it with more force. If you know that, this is going to be a tense situation at work or that you're going to uh, be tempted to stay in bed in the morning and not work out. If, if you anticipate this in advance, we find that you're better able to do something about it uh, when, when the time comes. What's happening when you watch a motivational YouTube video on the internet? You know, you watch some compilation of some guys lifting heavy weights or being really healthy or living some cool life, or it's Tony Robbins shouting at you through the screen. What What's going on with regards to motivation there? Uh, so these are two different examples. Uh, when you watch uh, athletes, I don't think that anything is happening. <laughs> you, you're just impressed by them. Uh, you don't want to uh, exercise by yourself. Okay? When you watch uh, uh Really successful people doing the thing that they do really well. Uh, this uh, is uh, not doing much. Uh, when you watch someone who wants you to be successful, uh, that's different. Okay? That is a, a role model, and that, that can be uh, motivating. Now, you you need to perceive that person as wanting you to be successful. And if it's a friend or a family member, someone that actually knows you and, and really wants you to be successful, that's easy. If it's a person uh, on YouTube, then you, you know you need to make some inferences here that this person actually cares about you. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you need to notice uh, to what this person values. So it's not usually so much about their actions as much as the, the values that these actions uh, convey, if, if you will. So, so what's, to give you, yeah, go ahead. To give you an example, like you no, know, the, the the products that we buy online. Let, let's say with YouTube, the the videos that we watch on YouTube are videos that uh, uh, other people liked, not necessarily that other people watched. We are much more attentive to the number of likes than the number of people, the the number of times that the video has no way. been viewed. Uh, yeah, uh, right. So we we follow what other people value more than what other people do. That is very interesting. Are there any other examples of how that shows out? Uh, shopping, we, uh, uh, we look at uh, a number of stars and not a uh, bestseller. It's often not even easy to find information on uh, um, how often people buy this product. We, we really care to see how much the people that bothered rating this product liked it. Um, it's what other people liked, not what other people do. Yeah. Yeah. And with products, I, I think that it's often a mistake. There is often more information in <laughs> what people do than. Uh, well, yeah, because a lot, of, especially with products, less so with entertainment, but with products, people can buy things for a utilitarian purpose. They don't necessarily, like, I don't love my dishwashing brush. Right, but I bought it, and I would happily buy another one. But I'm probably not going to be bothered to go and give it five stars on something. 
So you have a little bit of a selection effect here for what are the products that people are emotionally invested in. Exactly, right? And so you must find that there are the amazing reviews for this very special uh, product. It's not really like meeting what you need to do. What? So you've, you've mentioned there that motivational videos, you kind of need to infer that the person that you're hearing from has some sort of connection with you or is speaking to you in some way. That suggests that there is a big social element to how people can use motivation. What's the social support structure uh, pathway that helps us to be motivated? Uh, so we are social animals. Uh, we do things with uh, uh, other people and in the presence of other people. So for you know, some goals, and I would argue our important goals, we do them with others. Okay? We uh, uh, have projects at work with others. We uh, uh, do things with our neighbors. Okay? We start a family with someone or some people okay, that, that help us. Uh, and, and so we really want to see that we have the right company that we can do it together, that we know how to divide the work such that we don't have a huge problem of uh, social loafing. Uh, other goals we do in the presence of others, and so we we care for what is in fashion and what other people say is, is uh, worthy, uh, uh, what is appropriate. We just pay attention to others. And then on top of like th like these two ways in which we work with others, we also form relationships based on our goals. We are attracted to people that help us facilitate our goals and people are attracted to us because they see us as uh, supportive uh, of their goals. And so our goals, our motivations very much are the, the basis of our uh, relationships. What about actual relationships between people? I had a, a guy called Adam Lane Smith on the show a few months ago and he was saying uh, vasopressin bonding between uh, men and women is problem solving. So he talked about mm -hmm. how women heavily bond through oxytocin, but men bond quite heavily through vasopressin. So you have a problem. The man wants to feel useful. Honey, can you help me open this jar of beans or whatever? And the guy comes over and he does a thing. And that's bonding because... On average, men like to be involved in things and women like to be involved in people. So that kind of made a little bit of sense to me. But presumably goals and admiring your partner's ability to pursue and chase down their goals, both individually and as a pair, that must contribute to a successful relationship. Yes, yeah, so successful relationships require that you need each other, okay, and that you are instrumental for each other's goals and relationships at do not survive when uh, uh, you are no longer instrumental for each other. You are no longer uh, facilitating uh, uh, each other's uh, uh, goals. And, you know, sometimes people are aware of it and they do uh, uh, take joint projects for the sake of being instrumental uh, for each other. Uh, other times uh, people tend to be more aware of how much my... Uh, partner and uh, needs to support my goal than how much I need to support uh, their goals. We actually, we, we, we recently uh, uh, collected data from people asking how much you know your partner and how much your partner knows you. And like, in general, this is already a documented phenomenon. People feel that they know everybody more than everybody knows them. Okay, So uh, there is that symmetry where I feel that I, I know the people around me. I am more of a mystery to them. Uh, but what we recently found is that what predicts relationship, relationship satisfaction is uh, uh, how much uh, you feel that you are known. You feel that the other person in your life uh, knows and can support your goals. So the little that you give them credit that they actually know matters a ton. Why do you think that is? Uh, because this is uh, uh, what makes them useful for your motivation, what makes them instrumental for your goals. And this is really the, uh, the basis of the, the social bond, that uh, uh, we will work together, that we will do something together. And, you know, th there is a, a way to say that sounds a bit selfish, like we're just looking to, to use other people. And I, and I don't want it to, to sound uh, uh, like that. We bond to others over looking for help with our goals and willing to offer help with, with their goals. We work on 
stuff together and if we realize that we can be just more uh, thoughtful in how we, we make sure that we invest in our relationship that we have good relationships yeah i think if someone had a problem with the idea of being helped or, or using their partner to assist them with their goals that is under the presumption that the goal of a life is to live the most comfortable, least encumbered sort of existence that you can, which isn't the case, right? We, you know, you look back on over the last year, look back on the things that really, really mattered to you. The things that probably mattered weren't super easy. It wasn't that day when you woke up and everything was fine and there was no challenges and you didn't overcome anything. No, like you, you take value from the times when there is difficulty that is hard and you lean into it even harder and you come out the other side and things go well. So I, what the thing that was in my head there as you're talking about couples and projects is how many of my friends have decided to renovate the house with their missus and I hesitate. I'm not sure how good that's been for some of their relationships because based on like the feedback that I've got from them, some of those projects have nearly destroyed the relationship. But I understand that if you were able to manage the project a little bit better, it might work. Uh, yeah, well, renovations don't have great uh, uh, reputation, uh, but uh, uh, but you know it's it's something that we do as uh, as a couple, and uh, and and no, I I love this example. I would just ask any uh, couple. Uh, what uh, what do you need to do together? Okay, why, why do you need each other? Okay, what uh, what's your next goal? And, and maybe you are uh, saving for your vacation. Maybe you are planning your vacation. Maybe you're doing house renovation. Maybe you are uh, adopting a pet. Uh, but if there is a if if you don't no longer need that person in in your life, uh, it is uh, very uh, hard to maintain the relationship. And so uh, th this is when we we bring goals to support the relationship, other than bring people to support our goals. And both directions work. Yeah, that's a nice way to frame it. I'm also going to guess that I mean, having a child, you know, giving birth to a baby is the ultimate project. You know, and it's one that only you and your partner are usually involved in. It's 24 hours a day. There's a whole bunch of genetic components and motivations that are going on as well. So I imagine that uh, aside from the fact that you love your child and all the rest of it, having a child is a useful project to work together with your partner on. Uh, yes, although uh, uh, having a child is at least for the no the, the first period in the child's life is also an exhausting project <laughs> and uh, uh, that can strain the relationship so we definitely see that uh, you know when when two people that uh, already were struggling are now trying to maintain a relationship when they are both very very tired or at least one of them is very very tired uh that that's a problem okay there is a depletion of uh, uh, motivation and so uh you know it's it's one of those in instances of what doesn't kill you make you stronger and uh, a child to their relationship definitely makes their relationship stronger but first as long as that they the experience doesn't kill them unless it breaks it first yeah, <laughs> yeah precisely yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if the only purpose of the, the new goal is to get the, rela the relationship to be stronger, well, you know, adopt a cat. Don't go for the kids straight away <laughs> as the first one to try and fix the relationship. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good advice. Uh, what was the study that you looked at to do with, was it a signed book inside of a tote bag that talked about sort of degrees of freedom <laughs> away from something? Thank, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, this is a study that uh, was designed to test how much people are averse to invest in means. Like we want to walk toward goals. We want to uh, walk toward something that is, that is important, that is useful. We don't like to invest in means. So we don't like to pay for parking or shipping or gift wrapping. We don't like to study for prerequisite classes. What frankly Shady and I uh, did uh, was inviting our MBA students to submit bids on uh, a colleague's uh, book. And in one condition, that is one group of people, they were submitting their bids uh, on the book. Okay, They saw the book and they were telling us how much they are willing to pay. And another group of MBA students were 
bidding on a tote bag that contained that same exact book. And, and they knew that, okay, like they saw that the tote bag and, and the book, and we told them that they are submitting bids on the tote bag, but whoever gets the, the bag is also getting the, the book. So the first group has a, a, an inferior deal, okay, they're just getting the book. The second, they get a book and a bag. Uh, but uh, the first group was on average willing to pay $11 more than the second book. <laughs> than the second group. Uh, basically, the first group was paying $23 on average for the book, and the, uh, the second uh, uh, group was willing to pay $12 for a, a tote bag that uh, contained uh, the book. Uh, in economic terms, that means that the value of the tote bag was negative. Okay, It was a negative $11. Uh, that makes no sense. Uh, what's going on here uh, makes ecological sense. People don't want to pay for a means. They don't want to pay for a bag, but they are willing to pay for, for the book. Uh, and this is a nice illustration of uh, how, how in life we're often willing to invest so much more if it's the thing itself than if it's a way to, to get there. What's a more direct example about how this would be applied to our motivation? Um, so, you know, I talked before about uh, setting your goal as, uh, as having a job, not as applying for a job, uh, as, as getting the thing that you want and not as, uh, as the way to, uh, to get there. Uh, setting your goal in, as a destination, as, uh, as something that is exciting, as something that you, you want to uh, achieve and not anything that is on the way there. And, uh, uh, you know, some examples we specifically studied were, uh, you know, studying for something that is really a means to something else. People were not interested in the materials very much. Uh, uh, people uh, didn't want to buy products that uh, they will use in order to uh, get another uh, product. So uh, just define your goal in terms of the, the thing itself, not uh, the way there. That runs counter a little bit, I think, to some of the ways that people have framed process goals over the last couple of years. Again, like the whatever the aftershock of Atomic Habits has yeah. got a lot of people very focused on the process as opposed to the outcome. Um, and yeah, we are fighting against this this means versus actual goals thing. I wonder how many of the goals I set this year are poorly framed in that way. Well, I know for a fact that I've done avoidance goals instead of approach goals and you know replacing that with i want to use my phone less versus i will read for 45 minutes on an evening time like that's it, it achieves the same outcome but it's framed in a much more active and proactive way and also it makes you forget about the phone yeah and i i, I agree it's, it's a nuanced point here and I, so, so let me try to see if i can explain it in, in a clear way like we, we definitely want to set a goal that is exciting to do okay that is not just exciting to achieve that is exciting to do and so I, if I'm excited about, uh, um, you know, aerobic exercise uh, and, uh, and not so excited about running, then setting my exercise goal in terms of uh, do more aerobic and, uh, uh, and, and not more uh, running, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the way to go. Uh, but if I set my goal to concretely okay too much on on the level of the uh, the means uh, then i it, i don't have the vision okay i don't have the aspiration i don't know why uh, i'm doing it so you no know, if if i tell my son uh, your your goal is to take do your homework this is not motivating as uh, your goal is to to learn math okay your, your goal is to uh, uh, like read books and, and understand them and, and the way we are going to do this is like through this like homework uh, assignment but ultimately like if your goal in life is to do your homework that's just not inspiring that's just not uh, you know, like, this is like paying for a tote bag it's not it's not the thing okay it's just the way they are I yell at Fishback, ladies and gentlemen. If people want to keep up to date with the stuff that you do, where should they go? 
Uh, they should uh, get my book, get it done, and they should check my website, ayeletfishback.com, and uh, they will see all the ways in which they can uh, uh, connect with me, and I would be excited to connect with them. So, you know, thank you so much for making the introduction. My pleasure. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.